In today's video, I'm going to talk about my five biggest breakthroughs when it came to learning watercolour painting, things that really changed the game for me and completely sped up my learning process and ultimately improved the quality of my watercolour painting. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Michelle. On this channel, we do all things watercolour, as well as lots of drawing tutorials, even a bit of mixed media, some business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. It's completely free. And you'll be first to find out when I have a new video for you. I make at least one free video a week here on YouTube and you won't want to miss it. So have you ever been doing something for years and years in a certain way and you think it's all fine? You think you're doing it in the best way possible to get the best results possible and then someone shows you a different way of doing it or perhaps even just tells you some new information and all of a sudden you're like, oh, why didn't I know this before? It's a complete game changer for me. So what I've done is I've written down the five things when it comes to watercolour painting that affected me most in that way that were the biggest breakthroughs for me. So basically the subtitle of this video could be Stuff Michelle Did For You years and didn't know any better that you can learn from and get a much better result much faster than I ever did because there's nothing better is there than learning from someone else's bad experiences. So let's get started with breakthrough number one. So my first watercolour painting breakthrough came really before I even started to learn watercolour painting. So some of you know that I had a big break after school. I went back to painting and drawing and I did some sort of classes. I tried college. I wasn't really happy with anything. And then I went and took a uh, beginner's watercolour short course with a local artist. And the first thing that he taught me, and I didn't even know that this was optional, the first thing he taught me was to stretch my paper. And he just sort of said, well, you know, we're going to do watercolour painting and this is the thing that you do first. So to me, it was just always a given before I did any watercolour painting, I would stretch my paper. Now it's only years later, you know, with the internet being so big now and everybody communicating so much more often that I realised that's a huge controversy about it and people saying you shouldn't stretch your paper and people saying you should stretch your paper and people saying, oh, it's a faff, it's not worth it all of these different methods of doing it but I was just shown this really simple way of doing it it seemed very quick and easy to me and so I just did it and it was only years later that I realized what a big effect this had on the success of my watercolor paintings now to be clear there are other alternatives to stretching paper and there are different methods if you'd like to have a go at stretching your own paper you haven't done it yet or if you've seen it done you think well it's just so time consuming do have a look at the video that I'll post in the description of this video it's going to show you the method that I was taught years ago. I never bothered to learn a different way of doing it because it's just so fast and easy. There's no soaking your paper for hours or any of that nonsense. But why should you do it? Well, the reason you should do it is that it not only will your paintings dry flat and so they'll look lovely. And I don't know about you, but if I go into a gallery and I see a watercolour painting and no matter how beautiful it is, if the paper's all sort of wrinkled up and, you know, bumpy, I'm not always very impressed by that. But that's not actually the reason you should stretch your paper. The reason you should stretch your paper is because it's going to make your painting easier, which is going to make your progress faster. Now, why does it make painting easier? Quite simply put, it stops your paper bumping as much. It'll still bump a little bit while it's wet, but it stops it going as bumpy. Less bumps means less dips and less dips means less puddles. Now, when you have uneven water levels on your watercolor paintings, this is what causes drying lines. It's what causes back runs. It's what causes you to think, oh, what a beautiful sky, and then look at it 10 minutes later and it's all gone horribly wrong. So if you don't know what paper stretching is or you've dismissed it in the past as being fiddly and time consuming, there's a lot of nonsense talked about that, let's be clear. Do have a look at the video that I'll link in the description of this video. If you're watching on TV or something, you can't access that, just pop my name into the uh, YouTube search bar with paper stretching and it should come up for you. Now my second biggest breakthrough, and this is in some ways related to the first, and that's understanding that I could control how the watercolour moved on the paper. Now there are certain tutors and certain artists who will say, well, you know, watercolour can't be controlled, just go with your feelings, just throw it on, happy accidents. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't want accidents on my paper. And whilst happy accidents are lovely, for every one happy accident, you're likely to have nine very unhappy accidents. I personally would rather be in control. And I am a self-confessed control freak, but nevertheless, getting a bit of control over your watercolours can only be a good thing. Now, of course, you're never going to get 100% control over your watercolours or any other medium. Otherwise, you'd be the next Picasso. But you can control to a large amount what happens to the water when it's on your paper, how it moves, how it bleeds or doesn't bleed. You can control where your paint goes, where it stays. I have many videos on this channel talking about this, but I will just run through the basics for you now. 
So let's look at the most fundamental thing, understanding how the paint moves on the paper. It's such a simple principle. It's a single principle, just one thing to understand. And that will explain everything that happens once you put your paint on the paper, because all mediums change once we apply them. It may just be something subtle, like the reflection on the surface or the color as they dry. But watercolors change a lot, and that's because the water keeps moving. Though they have some binders in, they're not full of binders. And so you've mostly just got pigment and water, and so the water is going to do its thing. So as we know, water is heavier than air. It's going to seek a level. If I pour this all over the table, and anything's possible because I'm very clumsy, if I pour this all over the table, it won't stay put, it will spread out. And that's because it's heavier than air and it wants to seek a level. Now this explains everything that happens when you apply your watercolor paints. So let's put some paint on the paper. I've got a shockingly dirty palette here. I'm actually going to use this video almost to uh, was to clean the palette up because it really doesn't matter what colors I'm using here. This is a very old palette that I just found in the back of my cupboard. So I'm gonna put some paint on here. Now you can see where I stop painting, the paint stays put. It doesn't spread anywhere. And if I paint on top of other paint that's already dry, it will do the same, it shouldn't go anywhere. Now, just as a side note, if you paint on dry paper or dry paint and the paint bleeds, there are two possibilities. One is that it wasn't actually dry, the first layer or the paper isn't actually dry, you just think it's dry, you haven't given it enough time to dry. But there's a second possibility, and that is that the sizing may have come off the paper. Now the sizing is the coating, it may be gelatine, it may be in the case of the vegan papers that I use, it may be vegetable, cellulose, something like that. But if that has disappeared off the paper, usually through wetting it too many times or over soaking it, or sometimes just because you've got a faulty one from the manufacturer, then you may get bleeding on dry paper. So that's what's happening there. But generally speaking, if you're painting on dry paper, look at it, it's just staying put. So let me put some paint next to it. So it's got sort of semi dry now, hasn't it? The paint's damp, but it's not dripping wet. So I'm going to now put some paint that's wetter right next to it. Now it may take some time to happen, but what will happen now is that this paint, which is wetter, the area is wetter, and therefore the surface area, even though it may be tiny, is deeper. This paint wants to seek a level. So it's going to spread to areas where there's less water. It's going to spread over here. And we could make it you know, happen even more by putting more water in. And you'll see that it's going to spread into the yellow area to greater or lesser degree. So this is the reason I said to you that stretching paper is important because obviously if you get dips in your paper, then what's gonna happen is the paint that sits in the troughs of the paper is going to stay wet and the paint that's on the high bits of your paper is gonna dry faster and so you're going to get uneven water levels and then you're going to get bleeding between areas. And knowing this simple thing, knowing that this happens means that you can manipulate your paint you can stop it bleeding where you don't want it to bleed, but you can also get it to bleed in areas where you'd like to have those effects. And understanding this idea of the water seeking a level and wet areas bleeding into damp areas is the secret to understanding all of what's happening on your paper and to controlling your paint. Now I'm just popping in quickly to ask, have you been so engrossed in this video that you forgot to press the like button, the thumbs up button for me? If you like, share, subscribe, or leave me a comment, YouTube will push this video out to more people. I am within touching distance of 100,000 subscribers. I'm so grateful to all of you who watch me on YouTube. Please subscribe, it's free. And now let's get back to the video. Next, let's talk about the thing that I learned last really when it comes to painting and that was the hardest for me. Now, the thing I learned first would probably be drawing and then came other skills like color mixing, applying the paint, understanding how it moved. But the one thing I couldn't get my head around was composition. And what this meant was that my skills and my skill level kind of leapt ahead of the finished work. So in other words, I was doing paintings where all of the, uh, the watercolor was applied nicely, individual elements looked great, but the painting still looked rubbish. And why did it look rubbish? And I, you know, if I couldn't even figure out at first, like I've done all, I've done everything right. Why does this painting not look any good? And the answer was composition. And for many of you, it's not just composition. It's also things like drawing skills and layout and things just being pleasing. 
and proportionally correct and everything that you want to fit on your paper fitting on your paper. So do have a look at some of the drawing videos I've got for you on this channel that's really going to help you to get everything on your paper the right size. But I've also got a video for you all about composition. Composition is the secret sauce. For me, it was the hardest thing to learn because it's very sort of here and there. It's almost ethereal because there are rules. There are rules of composition. And then you look at a, you know, a great master's painting and realize they've broken the whole lot. But a bit like any skill, like dancing or driving, let's not mention my driving here, a bit like any skill, you start with the rules and you adhere tightly to the rules and then you can go a little bit away from the rules. Again, let's not mention my driving, but there are rules of composition. And once you learn a few basic rules, you're going to find it so much easier to create a pleasing painting. And the one thing that you must understand is that you need to get your drawing right before you ever put paint on it. It doesn't matter if that takes you a week. It doesn't mean that you have to have a very complex drawing, but you have to get your drawing right. It is never going to improve once you put the paint on. Putting paint on a bad drawing never makes it better. It just draws attention to the errors. And understanding the importance of composition and layout was the thing that finally enabled me not only to get sort of individual elements of my painting right and individual techniques right, but to get an overall pleasing effect to the finished piece of work. Now let's talk about colour, specifically watercolours. Now when I started out painting, one of the things that's always been my strong suit, so if composition was my weak area, then colour mixing was my strong area. It's been something that I've always been able to do. I've always felt that I sort of understood it on an instinctive level. Even when I was a kid, I would be sent off to buy something and colour match it to the thing I had at home. And as I got older and got into sewing and things like that, I'd go to the uh, sewing shop and see those hundred reels of cotton and I'd just pick out the right colour for the fabric I had at home. I didn't even take a swatch. I've always been able to hold colours in my brain. In more recent years, I've done things like design colour charts and worked with manufacturers to design paint colours. So colour mixing was always my thing. But there was one thing that I didn't understand when I started out and it's almost the technical side of colour. I didn't understand that not every pigment can be mixed because pigment is more than just hue. Now hue means colour, and there is more to any watercolour pigment than just colour. There's also texture, the amount it reflects light, the opacity, and some natural pigments simply can't be replicated. So let's have a closer look at watercolour paints and I'll explain what I mean and how you should start on your colour mixing journey. So let's talk about the mixing of colours. Now when I started out painting, I started out with a set like this, Ignore the fact that uh, some of them are a little bit low and there's a bit of muck here and there. This is what they call a split primary set. And I actually did this. I actually put colours out and I had more than this. I had about four of each primary colours. I was trying to be logical because I understood colour mixing and I thought to myself, well, I can't buy every colour in the world. So what do I really need? And I thought, well, I need some yellows, warm and cool, and the same with blues and the same with reds. And then I need some earth colours because I had read that it's very difficult to mix good earth colours. And this is the sort of set I started out with. And I understood that I didn't need to buy secondary colours because here I've got yellow and blue so I can mix green. I've got red and blue so I can mix purple. And I've got red and yellow so I can mix orange. So all of those three primary colours can mix all of the secondary colours. And having all of these colours, including these uh, earths and neutrals, meant that I could mix a huge range of colours. I used to make colour charts and everything. And, oh, you know, this is a fantastic way to start. So if you're looking to start out painting, you haven't got many colours, I do suggest you start with a split primary set. It's going to teach you so much about colour mixing. But it was only years later that I began to realise that perhaps I couldn't mix every single colour. As I began to understand the very unique properties that mineral paints have, and also something happened. I started looking at the pigment numbers on a tube of green paint and I became confused. So here we have yellow and blue and red and these are our artist primaries. And I can mix my yellows and my blues together and I can mix a nice range of greens. So I can take some of this colour and some of this colour and I can mix all sorts of greens and by varying, you know, warm and cools, light and dark, different pigments different amounts of water, I can get a nice big range of greens. So when I looked at tube greens, I was expecting that I would see a blue and yellow pigments in there. Now, some of them I did. Now, I've got a little bit of some Jackman's sap green here. I'm not going to bore you with details about pigment numbers. I've actually got a video coming up further towards Christmas that's going to explain exactly how you read paint tubes and pan paints and what all of the numbers mean, all of the pigments, all the series numbers, all the transparency, all of that. I'm going to explain the whole lot to you. But I just want you to know that 
within this sap green, and sap green is a color that varies between manufacturers. Within this sap green, I have some green pigment, some blue pigment, and some yellow pigment. Now green pigment, how does that work then? You would expect only to find blue and yellow. And look at this color here. I've got some chrome oxide green here. Now this is a single pigment, PG, which means pigment green 17. But I thought that yellow and blue, which are primary colors, made green, which is secondary color. And it was about that time that I discovered there's no one true set of primaries. In fact, there are three types of primaries. There are artist primaries, there are printers primaries, you know, with the cyan and the magenta and all of those colors. And then there are scientific primaries. Now, scientifically speaking, green is a primary color. So if you look at scientific primaries, and we're talking about measuring light and refraction of light, we're not talking about red, blue, and yellow. We're talking about green, blue, and yellow. And if that sounds familiar, you may have seen that on TV screens, things like that, RGB, red, green, blue. Now, as artists, we use yellow as our primary because as artists, we can't extract the yellow out of the green. We can't break down the colors into component light parts. Simpler for us to use red, blue, and yellow as our primaries. And yet here is a single pigment green. Not only is it a single pigment green, it has some very, very unique properties in terms of granulation and the amount of light it reflects. This idea that you can't mix every color doesn't just apply to greens, it applies also to things like earth colors because many paints are still made from natural pigments. So here I've got some burnt sienna and it's a really beautiful color. Now could I mix a color like this by combining my primary colors I could mix something like this. I could mix something like the chrome oxide, but it wouldn't be exactly the same. So it's important to understand that whilst you can start with a limited set of primary colors, and I really do think that's a fantastic way to get started. Nevertheless, don't be dismissive of other colors. Don't be dismissive of some of the more unusual colors because not every color can be mixed or replicated just by grabbing a few of your primaries. Now, one of the biggest problems I see with beginners work is they simply don't finish things. A lot of the time they go halfway through and they get disheartened. And this is because of the ugly stage. Now, the ugly stage isn't the bit in the morning before you put your makeup on. I would like to apologize right now to my postman. But really, if you're going to knock on my door before 10 a.m., then you take your chances. But the ugly stage we're talking about is the ugly stage in painting. Now, to be clear, all mediums go through an ugly stage. Now, the best part of painting is when you've got a blank sheet of paper, isn't it? Because then your optimism is high. The potentials are endless. You're just about to create a masterpiece and you can't wait to get started. Halfway through, it's all looking a bit like the stuff in your dog's food bowl and you're very disheartened and you're thinking about giving up. Now, whilst all mediums go through this stage, it's actually much worse with watercolor painting. And that's because with watercolors, you generally have to work fairly rigidly light to dark. And what this means is that at that halfway through stage, you have got mid-tones on the paper. You've not got any darks and everything is just looking a bit sludgy. Sometimes you may have put broad washes of color in because if you're doing any medium, with the exception possibly of certain types of printmaking or mosaics, things like that, any medium really has to be built up in broad areas of color. You may with oil paints start dark to light, but nevertheless, the process is similar. You're blocking in large areas and then you're putting in detail. With watercolor, you have to go light to dark because you can't paint lighter colors over darker ones due to the transparent nature of the paint. And this means that watercolors above all other mediums can look shockingly awful halfway through. Now, perhaps you're thinking to yourself, well, I bet that doesn't really happen to you, Michelle. I've seen your paintings, they're not too bad. I bet that doesn't happen to you. So luckily for you today, I have bought receipts. So let's look first of all at a drawing. And I'll put a picture of it up here. Now, this is a drawing I did fairly recently of a cat. And here you can see it at the halfway stage. So what did it look like? It looks like a three-year-old has tried to draw a teddy bear and failed badly. I could have looked at it at this point and given up. Luckily, I pushed through and I kept working on it and put the details on. And although it's not the best piece of work I've ever achieved, nevertheless, I'm perfectly happy with it. So here's what it looks like now. And imagine if I had just stopped at that point and just given up. What about watercolors? Well, let's look at something that looks even worse halfway through. So one of my favorite paintings in probably the last five years has been the painting that I did of a toucan. I was absolutely delighted with it. And yet there was a stage halfway through when it looked beyond bad. And I was actually doing it for an online tutorial. And I'm thinking to myself, my God, you know, I, I can't stop doing this painting because all these people are following along. I'm gonna to have to try and pull it out of the bag. So this is what it looked like when it was halfway through. I mean, again, it looks like something a child has done. 
done. There's no definition to it. There's no color contrast. And it's nothing like the pristine, beautiful bird that I had seen a photo of and that I wanted to replicate. Luckily, I pushed through and kept going because this is how it turned out. Now, you might say to yourself, well, that's all very well for you, Michelle, but you're not bad at painting as we've previously discussed. So you're always probably gonna get a better result at the end. Now, I'm here to tell you, you should still carry on with it because there are processes you go through as you get to the end of a painting whereby you're putting in darks and bringing up color contrast and putting in details that you need to practice. So I want you to continue with your paintings past the ugly stage, even with the knowledge that it may not turn out okay. It may only be fit for the rubbish bin, but it doesn't matter because time spent painting is never wasted and you will have learned a huge amount. We don't just learn from the things that go right. In fact, some people would say we only learn from the things that go wrong. It's much more likely to fix itself in your brain, the trauma of it for one thing, if you did it wrong. So I want you, when you get to that ugly stage, to say, well, this is just what happens. I'll push through and see what happens. Sometimes you're going to surprise yourself with an amazing result, and sometimes you're just going to get some very valuable practice. So do let me know in the comments if any of my experiences will perhaps help you going forwards. And let me know your own breakthroughs as well, because I could have made 20 or 30 breakthrough moments. These were just the ones that resonated with me the most. But I'd love you to share in the comments because then we can all learn together. And there may be something that you have learned that will help other people. Before you leave this video, don't forget to have a look in the video description. I've got loads of free stuff down there for you. I've got free downloadable PDFs of information on drawing, on watercolor pencils and watercolor painting. You can also find out all about my online courses. There's even a free watercolor painting course that you can take for no money whatsoever. Now we discussed in this video getting a correct underdrawing. I'm gonna put up a video now that will help you to get that right because a bad drawing never becomes a good painting. You'll want to watch this video next.